Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Privileged to be your host, this is Dan Moore. We are looking forward to sharing our guest with you on the Action Catalyst today. Ken Coleman is a number one national best-selling author, career expert, and nationally syndicated radio host of The Ken Coleman Show. Pulling from his personal struggles, missed opportunities, and career successes, Coleman helps people discover what they were born to do and provides practical steps to make their dream job a reality. The Ken Coleman Show is a caller-driven career show that helps listeners who are stuck in a job they hate or searching for something more out of their career. Dan and Ken will discuss on this episode his second book that just released in May, The Proximity Principle, the proven strategy that will lead to the career you love. Enjoy this episode. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Action Catalyst. This is Dan Moore, your, co- your host, and we are really excited today to have Ken Coleman with us. You've just heard a little bit about Ken and his background. Ken, as a leading broadcast host yourself, it is terrific to have you on the show. So welcome to the Action Catalyst. Well, I'm thrilled to be with you. Well, this is great. You know, our listeners are, are people that are seeking insight and inspiration, and our guests have so much to offer. What could you share about some of the major pivot points and turns in your career influences that you've had that have enabled you to be in this position of tremendous influence now? Well, when I think of the pivots uh, in my career, I think of, you know, some key, key moments. I think, uh, uh, you know, I don't think of all the small pivots. I think of the major, major switches and changes that I had to deal with and then ones that I had to make intentionally. So I think of, you know, there's two types of pivots that I think I faced and I think everybody faces the ones that are uh, forced on you and then the ones that you choose. And um, I think of uh, a moment where I was working uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, I was working for a company and I had already begun to wrestle uh, that I wrestle with this idea that I wasn't going to pursue the path of public office, which is what I would had been preparing for for years. Hmm. Uh, in politics. And I had gotten into the private sector to build a, a business resume, a leadership resume that was non-political, you know, and then kind of position myself. And so I'm already wrestling uh, with that, whether or not that was really the right move and and really questioning that. And that was a bit unsettling because I'd had been so driven towards that for a long time. And as I'm wrestling with that, the company I'm working for gets sold literally at midnight. And uh, on a Sunday night, and we come in on Monday morning, total surprise, no idea it was happening. And I was on the executive team, and uh, only one of our, you know, only our CEO had been made aware of it. And so we show up, and he says, hey, in 20 minutes, we're having a company-wide meeting, and it's been sold. And so we had about 20 minutes to, you know, uh, soak on it before we go into the to the staff meeting, and I'll never forget that. And 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 I pretty much knew that my time there was done. I didn't know the new ownership that well, thought that there's probably not a chance that I'm going to survive because they got their own executive team. Mm-hmm. And that was what happened. It was, you know, not ugly. Uh, but, you know, within 30 days, I was pretty much on my way out. And so that was a moment where I was already wrestling with, am I headed down the right path and beginning to question what the other path and alternate path might be? And that was one that I didn't choose. That was a pivot I didn't choose. It was given to me. It was, here's the deal. You either pivot or you die, you know, right. you, you, and so you've got to pivot. But that was a big moment for me because it forced me out of the nest and everything that I had been considering and wrestling with, it forced me to get super clear on that. And uh, I'm really grateful for that because that's when I, I really said, okay, yep, this is right. Um, I don't want to run for office. I don't want to go that direction. I've lost the juice for that particular path. And this broadcasting thing, as scary as it is, as unknown as it is, 
uh, that's where my heart's beating. And so I'm going to have to take steps to uh, start doing that and position myself to be able to chase it. So that was one major, major pivot. Um, and then another pivot that I'll call out uh, was one that I chose, and that was to to not go the path of sports broadcasting. Hmm. Uh, as I got into broadcasting, uh, this is fast forwarding, you know, a few years down the road. I've always loved sports. I played every sport there was. I love sports to this day. And, and so I thought, well, you know what? Sports talk, that would be an interesting thing. I'd love to talk sports all day, every day. But as I got into it, and got in proximity to it and was interning and all of these things. I realized that while I love sports and I would have fun talking about sports, I would die pretty quick um, because the end result of the work of a sports broadcaster did not feed the passion for me. I wanted to broadcast on behalf of others, meaning I wanted to broadcast to create uh, maximization or restoration. Mm-hmm. Those were two key themes for me. And I didn't realize that at first, Dan, until I got into it. And then I realized that if I was doing sports broadcasting, I would be broadcasting to entertain. Now hear me, there's nothing wrong with broadcasting to entertain if that's your jam, right? If that's, if that's your passion to entertain folks, there's tremendous value in entertaining others that I didn't want to entertain. I wanted to equip and encourage. And so that was a choice to say, okay, it's not sports broadcasting. I want to do a different kind. I want to be on talk radio and I want to do my own version of what, you know, and I, you know, Oprah and Larry King, you know, and I started thinking of all these different ideas and I had a general idea, having no idea what it would look like and very scared about it, but at the same time, very certain about it. So those would be two really big pivots in my life. Mm-hmm. So they, they required you to do some values clarification about what you were really seeking. Yep. It was not the direction you thought you were going to be in. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And the discernment between a self-imposed and a personally imposed decision. I think that's one of the things that people need to understand too, that we do have choices. Yep. Unless there's an external event like the company getting sold at midnight, uh, which that's right. definitely happened with you. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I'll just make one quick point on that. If you're living on purpose and working on purpose, you will have to do some self-imposed pivots. Mm -hmm. There's no way around that. Mm -hmm. Even if you're within the same company, you can redefine what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, again, in order to continue to grow in advance, there's going to be some form of a pivot. And uh, it's, it's, it's it just is what it is. If someone's progressing and progressing positively here. So we're talking about healthy growth and progression. Mm -hmm. You will be presented with forks in the road, you know? And so, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about. You're going to have to choose to pivot one way or the other. Right. Especially when you've lost your dribble, right? If you can't pivot, you're stuck. Boy, isn't that the truth? (laughs) The strength is in the dribble. Keep the dribble alive as long as possible. That's right. Otherwise pivot, pass, do something great. That's awesome. Um, well, here's, here's kind of a question. Um, how, how does a person discern if the problem is in the job they're in or the way they're performing at it? In other words, blaming the job as opposed to themselves. Is, is there something people need to do to self-examine on that point? Yeah. So the answer to that uh, from a macro point of view is you have to discern the answer to this question. Am I the lid or is the organization and the job the lid? So that's, so we look at, we start there. We go, okay, there's a lid right now on my progress. So the question is, am I the lid or am I in a situation, an organization where there's no ladder for me? There's no opportunity for growth. They don't promote growth. I've maxed out. I've done everything I could do. So if we look at ourselves, then the best way to start with this is let's do, let's do, just try to do some honest assessment, but then let's always check our own assessment because nobody, nobody has blind spots like a human being. You know, you can't show me a big bulky ship or a car or a truck that's got more blind spots than a human being. So let's try to take an honest assessment of, do I feel like I'm doing the best I can do? Am I growing? Am I, um, am I contributing at my highest level? Uh, And then we're going to go ask some other people. Let's ask some coworkers. Let's have the guts to ask our leader. Hey, listen, I want to grow professionally. 
and as a result of growing professionally, then I would receive more influence and then more, more pay as a result of more responsibility and influence and the pay follows that. And you're sitting down with your leader going, hey, what's a growth plan look like for me? Let's start with, am I growing? Where are some areas where you think that I can do better? And, and so we do that by looking at peers and then we look at our leader and we want to get a true honest assessment to make sure that we're not delusional. Now, let's just say, Dan, that we do all those things and even sitting with our leader, they go, Hey, you're doing a great job. I mean, you could, you could, I mean, you might be able to get better here and here, but this is little, I mean, you're doing a great job and you go, okay, so I've done a 360 assessment here and I'm doing a really darn good job. I ought to be able to be moving up. And so when I sit with my leader and I say, what's a growth plan look like? And they keep kicking the can down the road and they don't come back with a, well, if we do this and this and this, then, then we'll be able to move you up. But there's no vision from your leader about a ladder for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cause that's important for human beings. We need progress, upward mobility. You got to show me a ladder. When a human being doesn't see a ladder, Dan, they're going to start to start looking elsewhere. And so when we get to that point, we now know, Oh, this is the organization. Um, Uh, There is not a plan for growth. Um, You're looking for two things in a healthy organization. I call it a place to grow in the book, the proximity principle. Two things. Number one, is there a track record of the company developing their people? And then do they promote their people? Because when you're in an organization that has a track record for developing, promoting, man, that's great. That means there's a ladder. Now, flip it to the other side of the question. If you're in a situation where uh, you're doing the right thing and you love the work itself and yet you still feel as though you've lost the juice, there's no connection, uh, you're just kind of miserable coming in, that means that you're doing the right thing in the wrong place. Hmm. So don't question the career or the job, question the place. Give me an example of this. I get this call a lot on my show. I get a call from a school teacher, starts off the call, Ken, I'm burned out and I don't know what to do next. And before I ever start going down the next, I want to know why they're feeling the way they're feeling. And almost every time, Dan, we hear that they love teaching students, but what they, what they don't love is the behavioral problems, the paperwork, the unbelievable pressure for the standardized test scores and all this kind of garbage. And I say to them something like, if I could remove those three things that suck your soul away every day, would you love teaching? And they light up. It's a completely different person. Oh my gosh, I love it. So that's an example of somebody doing the right thing in the wrong place, meaning their primary role in life is to instruct, Mm -hmm. to teach, to guide. The problem is they're doing it in the wrong place. So you can be in your sweet spot at the intersection of what you do best and what you love to do most and still be miserable. So to, that, that's the, the answer to your question. It's a couple reasons, you know, it's either you or it is the job, but there's two ways of looking at it. Is it the company itself or is it the, the actual context of the job? Like that teacher example where you're just in the wrong place. So if you're teaching in higher education or maybe you're doing corporate training all of a sudden, you're training adults, you know, or you're on the community college level where the people you're teaching actually want to be there. Well, that's a whole different ballgame. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic distinction, Ken. And I'm glad you pointed that out because people do need to take that responsibility to figure out who they are and what they're doing and look at their environment and see if they can find a place where they can remove those constraints, whether it's bureaucracy, paperwork, lack of direction in the company. That's right. But realize who they are can continue to go. That's why some athletes can have the same amount of talent, thrive under different leadership in the same sport. So that's right. A big, big, big part of that. Well, you referred to the, to your book Pro- proximity principle. Tell us a little bit more about it. What, what caused you to want to write it? What was the inspiration behind that? Well, long before it was a book, it was a thought that I got on the way to work one day about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, I was uh, at a stoplight and I was looking at the first thing on my calendar that day. And I was going to be a guest on a podcast much like this. And the, the host had sent some pre-prepared questions and I was kind of scanning those real quick, you know, and I saw the last question uh, on the document was if you could narrow down your success in broadcasting to one thing, what would it be? And I kind of scoffed at it. and was like, Oh, that's a bad question. I mean, it's impossible to do that. 
And then I did a quick attitude change. I said, okay, let me, let me try to answer this the best way possible. And if I was going to single out just one thing, what would be one important thing that I did that allowed me to, at 32, switch careers and go into a very difficult field, a very competitive field, and uh, succeed? And I don't know if you're like me, Dan, but when I'm driving, I do my best thinking. I don't know why that is, but my wife hates it because sometimes I'm a little absent-minded on directions, but boy, I sure am having some good thoughts, you know? And so I'm driving and I narrow this question down to, to two things. I was good at putting myself around the right people and in the right places. And it was by doing that, that I got opportunities that may not have ever come to me and therefore allowed me to, to do it. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. I like that. I'll go with that answer. And somewhere over the next five miles, the word proximity popped in my mind. And I was like, it's all about proximity. And then I got my phone out and uh, I recorded a voice message. And this is exactly what I said. The proximity principle says in order to do what I want to do, I've got to be around people that are doing it and in places where it is happening. And I hit stop. And I was like, oh, I think that's good, but I don't know if that's good or not. And so as soon as I got into the office, I ran up to my leader and I said, hey, Jeremy, I got I to gotta play something for you. And I want you to be really, really brutally honest with me. And if you like it, I'll give you the context. And I played it for him. He went, that's gold. And so I started sharing it on my radio show that day and it started to pick up steam. Mm-hmm. And then it, then it became a book where I outline, as you know, now the five people that I put myself around and the five places that I put myself in. And then we finish it off with four practices that everybody can use around the right people in, in the right places. So that's where it came from. And I, and it's important that I tell the story because I want people to understand this is not just some cute little idea that I cooked up. This is nothing new. It's just, I've kind of put some language around it and, and a principle behind it so that people can clearly see that the true key to opportunity is proximity to the right people in the right places. If you want opportunity, and that's what everybody wants, why people come to this nation. If you, if you, this is not a political statement, but if you interviewed every immigrant, whether illegal or legal, that's ever come here, and you say, give me one word, why'd you come to America? And they'd go, opportunity. This is what every human being wants, opportunity. Just give me a chance, coach. Put me in the game. Give me the ball, right? And so I wanted to break down for people this myth that success and opportunity is just something that the fortunate few get a chance to grasp. No, no, no. It's there for everybody. And I don't care how late you are in the game. I don't care what career you're in. If you want to get in, and you want to move up and, and keep progressing, it's going to always be about the intentionality to surround yourself by the right people and in the right places. Now, to this book, it was written for people who aren't where they want to be in their career. And so specifically, I'm saying, look, I don't care what it is, but if you're around people that are doing what you want to do, then they're going to give you insight Wisdom, so that's knowledge, then wisdom, and they're going to point you to other right people. They're going to point you to the right places. And when I'm around other right people, they do the same thing. And then when I get in the right places, I meet more of the right people. And what you see is a cycle of intentionality that does nothing but churn up opportunity. It's like going to a train station. If you're in proximity to the right people, Dan, and and you're in proximity to the right places, if you just stay there, opportunity is going to show up. It'll knock on your door, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. But you use that phrase intentionality, because I know you've also said nobody's waking up every morning trying to think about what's the best career path for Ken Coleman. That's right. We've got to take that on ourselves. That's right. This is going, this is, this is two things. So the intentionality is I'm looking, constantly scanning who are the right people. Where are the places that I need to be? Well, that's, that's number one. That's the first intentional act. And then the second intentional act is now I'm going to put myself there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to look for a mutual connection. 
Uh, I'm just going to show up and volunteer like I did at a sports radio station, ESPN affiliate in Atlanta. I'm making six figures running my own company and I show up and freak this poor little receptionist out. She's probably 23 years old. And I show up and I say, Hey, uh, I'm here to see, uh, so-and-so I don't want to say his name cause he's still there. And, uh, and, and, and I'm here to see him and he's the program director and I just need two minutes with him. She goes, do you have an appointment? I go, no, but I really only need two minutes. I got my iPhone right here. I put a two minute stopwatch on it. Uh, telling that I know so-and-so and had a mutual connection. And, um, uh, I just want to talk to you for two minutes and I don't want anything from you and I'll be out. He can time me. You can bring security with me. She looked at me like I was an alien. <laughs> she made the phone call. The guy walked out. He was kind of looking at me like an alien. I had the two minutes on the stopwatch and I did the whole meeting right in front of her. And when two minutes was done, he goes, come on back to my office, man. You're cool. That's how I got interning at a ESPN radio affiliate. And I was there Monday, Wednesday, Friday for three hours, screening phone calls, doing YouTube research, getting Sprite for the guy who's on the air who made less money than me. Like that's an intentional act. You got to get there. And, mm-hmm. and so it's not just seeing the opportunity. It's not just seeing where you need to be. It's getting where you need to be. There's plenty of people, Dan life is the, the road to success is littered with people who saw the right people knew the right people saw the right places, knew of the right places and didn't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. To get to the train station, you got to leave your house first, right? That's it. That's amazing. Now you, you do talk about five people we need to be proximate to. I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts about professors, you know, which doesn't mean yeah. somebody with a PhD necessarily. That's right. So the professor is simply defined as somebody who can teach me the fundamentals of what I need to learn do to actually get qualified to enter the dance floor, right? What do I got to do to get in the dance? Well, you got to be qualified. So there's always something you need to learn and do to get qualified. So we want to find that professor. This is an archetype. Again, doesn't have to be a college professor, as you pointed out, but it's somebody who can teach me the fundamentals that I need to learn in order to get qualified. And not just they can teach me, they want to teach me. Mm-hmm. So the example of this in my book is a guy by the name of Jeff Batten who had a broadcasting school. He was a successful television radio producer. And um, he was doing this new school to teach people how to get into the broadcasting world. And he had touted all of his, you know, current uh, work and past work and everything. And I went and met with the guy and I interviewed him. And I came away going, this guy can be my guy. He can teach me what I need to know. He could teach me the basics of uh, how to talk on the mic and how to do some uh, basic script writing and play by play and all these things. And it was a sports broadcasting school, but to this day, you know, I use some of the techniques that Jeff taught me. And so he's an example of somebody who could teach me and he wanted to teach me at a school. I had to pay him for it. But the point is he was about teaching the fundamentals. You want to find that person because they're the ones that are going to teach you the best. And sometimes the best teacher is not necessarily the best practitioner because it's comes 100%. to automatic to that practitioner. You need somebody that's more of a conscious, competent, and they can pass that on to you. That's right. Although I would say this, you don't want to take shop from a high school professor. You know, you, you, you want to learn how to build something. Then, you know, you, you go work with somebody who's a builder, you know, who's a carpenter and have them teach you some stuff. So um, they may don't have to be the best, but they gotta, they've got to have some actual experience. And the oh, reason yeah. I point this out is because we're in a world now, Dan, where we got an expert, experts are a dime a dozen. And I only give someone the expert title if they've actually done at a high level what it is they say they can help me learn how to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in theory. I'm interested in experience and expertise. And the expertise comes from doing it and being really, really good at it because you failed along the way and you've gotten good. So I would point that out. You know, they don't have to be rock stars, but they got to be good. Well, I, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. And then they have to know why they're good because sometimes people say, well, I just, I just do it. It just comes naturally to me. And that's not helpful if you need, techniques, skills, That's et right. cetera. So somebody can break it down for you. That's right. Like a good coach would do. So I think it's great. So professors and professionals, people that are, are two of the categories we got to spend some time with. Now, proximity, of course, is where we are, what's close to us. So what are, what are some of the places people need to try to put themselves in order to learn what they need to learn? Yeah. Well, you know, there's five places I can rip through them real quick. Uh, we start though with 
with the place that I think, Dan, most people overlook. And that's where you are. Hmm. Um, that's why it's the first place we write about in the book, because it's the one that everybody overlooks. And then, of course, we go into a place to learn, uh, a place to practice, a place to perform, and a place to grow. But where you are is so important because this is where you start. It, 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 it's the inertia, the forward movement. Many times it's just simply acting on that first decision and I'm going to do something right where I am. So let me give an example. Uh, we call it the law of the zip code in the book. And the law of the zip code says everything I need to get started is already around me. I get this call all the time on my radio show. Ken, uh, I know exactly what I want to do. The problem is I got a wife and three kids, two dogs, mortgage, golf club membership. My mom lives down the road, and she's thinking about moving in the attic with us if we get it finished, and blah, 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 and I can't move. And the idea that they got to move somewhere to go somewhere is really short-sighted. Now, what I mean here is that to get started doesn't mean you got to change zip codes. Now, there might come a time in your journey where the next step in your path and, and progressing forward does require a change of zip code. But it never requires a change of zip code to get started. It just never does. You, you won't convince me otherwise. Uh, because, again, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm taking a broadcasting school 20 minutes from my house. Um, and And it's not the Mecca. It's not... LA, it's not New York, it's not Chicago, you know, it's, I'm just in a, a suburb of Atlanta, learning how to do the basics of broadcasting. That was a huge starting point for me, because I said, all right, I'm going to go after this, I'm going to put myself out there, and I'm going to begin the process of learning what I need to learn. And so the first place we talk about in the book is where you are. Stop looking outward and looking, oh, you know, if I want to do this, I might have to go here and here. Here's what happens. I'm convinced, Dan, that that becomes a really easy excuse to not get started, mm. to not do what you know in your heart you're supposed to do. Because watch this. Well, Ken, if I, if I want to do this, this is a small area, and there's just not much opportunity to do what I want to do in my area, and um, we just can't afford to move right now, so I'm just going to – I can't do it right now. And what you've just said to yourself is this. Well, it's uh, financially, it would be really risky for us to move. And uh, the smart thing would uh, be to not move. And I've got to be a smart, good person and take care of my family and be a part of the family. So uh, I'm going to have to die to my dream, but that's the good thing to do, which is a complete crock of crap. You've just taken your limitations that you created and you've turned them into an excuse as to why you didn't pursue the dream so that later in your deathbed, you're going to try to reason yourself into why you never went for it as you sit there soaking in regret. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that doesn't sound really warm and fuzzy, but I'm just telling you exactly what it is. That's exactly what that is. It's an excuse. When even in the smallest town, there's a course you could take online. There's a webinar you could watch. There's a podcast you could listen to. There's a book you can order. And Amazon delivers to Red Dirt, Idaho, last I checked. So don't tell me that you can't begin the process of learning even in the smallest of towns. Don't tell me that you can't figure out a path and a plan and you can't go make a little extra money and save up to, to the point that if you need to eventually move and go do something a long way away, then you could do it. But you can get started where you are and there is no next if you don't do something in the now. And so that's the place that I get the most fired up about because it's what really truly holds most people back. They stay in the starting blocks of life. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine Dan, I love the summer Olympics. Imagine watching the 100 meter race and it's the gold medal race. And the guy comes up with the starter pistol and fires it. And only one guy leaves the blocks and the rest of the guys are just hanging out in the blocks. It's not a race. You'd be like, everybody look at what's going on. What's wrong with these guys? They didn't even leave the blocks. They're still stuck in the starting blocks. Did somebody glue their shoes? What's going on? It would be preposterous. But that's what most people are doing. They, they're not even starting. So no wonder you're stuck. The Chinese have a proverb that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Boom. And you can't get to the thousandth mile until you do that no. step. So mm -hmm. I love that proximity. 
you know, there's an old story about the greatest diamond mine in South Africa was on a farm of a guy that mm. sold the farm because there was no opportunity in the farm and he wanted to go find diamonds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And they were, they were right there. They were right yeah, there. Exactly. Um, you also talk about a, a place to, to practice and a place to perform. Um, did, can you do that within your existing company? I guess it depends, doesn't it? On what it depends. Is. The way I wrote it in the book and what I'm talking about here is, is uh, the place to practice um, is this is low risk. And this is, again, something that a lot of adults will overlook. And uh, it certainly works in broadcasting. You'll hear this from a lot of successful broadcasters. I've heard this. Uh, but this is transferable to any industry. The place to practice is the example of what I did at the radio station where I went down and I volunteered my time for three days a week, three mm -hmm. hours a day. I'm, I'm practicing. I'm getting in there. I'm learning a little bit about the industry. I'm getting to do some things, but it's not a full-time job. It's not even a part-time job. I was basically a glorified intern at 32 years of age. That's a place to practice. I'm in proximity to a place where I just get to practice. There's no risk. It's not my livelihood on it. I'm getting some clarity here. I'm confirming that this is in fact something I want to do. That's a place to practice. Now, a place to perform, that's where we go to job level, right? That's now we're in, we've got our entry level position, or at least we're in a position where we're now in the industry that we want to be in, right? That will eventually lead us to the dream job. So, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of career switchers or just people that are going, it's not that I'm switching careers. It's just I never did what I wanted to do, and now I want to go do that. So how do I get in? Mm -hmm. And so this idea of a place to perform, this is where we actually now, we've, we've done the training, right? A place, a place to learn. We've learned everything we need to learn. We're getting qualified. We've gone in there. We've done some low-level practicing, whether it's interning or, or auditing and just kind of volunteering our time and we're getting our hands dirty when they're and, 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 and we've done all, doing all this while we're truly getting qualified. And then once we're ready to go, we step in and now this is game on. We're getting paid for this. So our place to perform is now we're doing this for money and this is – this is for real, right? So now we're getting measured on our uh, actions or there, there's measurables here. We got to perform. So that that's the difference there. And, and again, I say this, Dan, because a lot of people don't realize how easy it is for them to audit or shadow some people around in the workplace to actually volunteer so that you can get up close and personal. Uh, this isn't just like nonprofit and politics where you go volunteer. You can volunteer anywhere. Mm -hmm. You're not a moron and don't act like a complete goofball. You'd be surprised where you can go and what you can do. There's great power in the phrase, I will work for free. Huge. <laughs> and if you're Huge. willing to take the time and effort. That's exactly. And by the way, it's almost impossible to get a no on that. Mm -hmm. That's right. If you're halfway decent, competent, and sincere in your desire to learn, there's no doubt. That's the key. You go, hey, here's why I'm here. I don't right. want any money. I'm not going to ask you for money. Mm -hmm. I truly am here because this is a part of my journey. And I want to help for the purposes of providing value while I learn more about this, because this is what I want to do one day. So I'll do anything just to be able to get in the building. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. You say that, you won't believe the doors that will swing open for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic advice. It's like Bobby Knight said, the will to win is important, but not as important as the will to prepare. That's right. And so putting that in is so key. If, if we can jump ahead, some of these ideas, when you have the proximity mindset, let's say you found where you, you want to be, you think it's got the opportunity, you speak about your role, knowing it, accepting it, maximizing it. Can you can expand on those parts for us? Yeah, these three things that you just mentioned are the key to progress. I don't, no, care. I don't care what level you're on in your career. So I don't care if you're just starting out as a 20-something out of college or you're in your 40s and you've recently got a new role. Knowing your role means clarity. Now let's talk about what that means. At Ramsey Solutions, where I work, every person, we have 900 plus employees, every person has what we call key results area um, sheet. And it's a one sheet. And this is the leader and the team member are on the same page. And the leader has defined, these are your key results areas. It's not just your job 
these are your areas where you've got to create results. In other words, you do these things well, this is a win. So that's clarity. You'll be surprised, Dan, how many companies don't do this and, and how someone will get hired and they know what their title is. And when everything else is kind of like, I kind of know I need to do this, but there's not a lot of clarity there. And so when it comes time to get measured, the leader doesn't really know what they're measuring and you don't know how you're being measured. And so we've got a lot of frustration. So the key to advancement is clarity. So even if your leader doesn't give it to you, you ask for it. This is a way to lead up. Mm-hmm. Say, Hey, will you put on a piece of paper? I'm cool with it. What I need to do that would constitute a win in your eyes. Well, they're going to love that because they really only care about one thing, you helping them win. So go ahead and, and do that. So now we got clarity. So that's what know your role means. Be really clear on what your role is because here's the deal. There is no next, Dan, if you don't win in the now. So these three things are really important to keeping our perspective where it needs to be so that we can win in the now and get the opportunity for next. Second thing is uh, accept your role. This is an attitude issue. It may not be the dream job. It's just your entry point. And as a result, there's this human element, this, this thing in our nature where we're always thinking about the next. Well, wait a second. I got to be grateful. I got to be thankful for this role because this role was positioning me for the future. So let's have an attitude of gratitude. This will keep you where you need to be mentally and emotionally as we persevere and have to be patient. Third thing, maximize your role. This is effort. So we talked about clarity, we talked about attitude, now we're talking about effort. Now that we know what our key results area are, we're going to do all that and we're going to crush it. But now we're looking for other ways to serve the leader, to help our coworker, to be an amazing teammate, to find value and do things that people didn't expect and go above and beyond what is expected. Those are the people that get noticed and those are the people that get promoted. So the proximity mindset is know your role, accept your role, maximize your role. That is the formula for progress. And as much as I hate to say it, we're going to have to end on that very high note because time with you goes like fast, 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 Ken. Oh, cool. Wow. I love what you just had to share with everybody because regardless of whether a person owns their own business or whether they're trying to think about what to do in their nonprofit or whether they're just a person trying to live life well, that's gold what you just shared. And Thank you. About being in the right situation, figuring out intentionally what you want to do and then taking the right actions. So you're what the action catalyst is all about. Thank so you, sir. For you on being on the air here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Keep up the great stuff. And your book, of course, I've got here to share the proximity principle. And this is available wherever good books are sold, not where bad books are sold. That's right. Only good ones. And it's phenomenal material. I would encourage everybody to to check into this and listen for Ken on his own show and spend time with him because it's time well spent. So thank you for being on the Action Catalyst, Ken. Thanks, Dan. I had a blast. Appreciate you. You bet. You too. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst and Twitter at Catalyst underscore action. Thanks for listening. This episode is sponsored by Southwestern Coaching. Southwestern Coaching has helped over 12,000 people increase their incomes by over 25% on average. As a successful salesperson, you know the importance of increasing your sales. But sometimes you might just need a little extra push and accountability to meet your goals and grow your business. Southwestern Coaching will help you increase your income through one-on-one sales and leadership coaching tailored specifically to your needs. Together, we will elevate sales. To schedule your free one-on-one business action planning session with a Southwestern Coach, go to www.southwesternconsulting.com forward slash action catalyst.